So we're going to first talk about an overview of DBI or database instruction in reading. And in this first part, we're going to talk about how this DBI process applies to reading. So let's see what this looks like in practice. Here's an example of a graph, some graph data that a teacher uh, collected. These graphs of performance and progress are really important because it creates that nice picture that really demonstrates how the student's doing. And this picture can be used to communicate with teachers, uh, with parents, and in some cases the student can be looking at this. Uh, nice to communicate this data, for instance, at conferences in this graph format. Uh, easy to understand. So let me just orient you to the pieces of this uh, graph. First of all, we have the baseline where, this, where the student started. So right here we've got sort of that baseline starting point. And we'll talk later about how to establish that baseline. Then from there, the teacher actually set this nice goal line and you can see it's labeled here but the goal line goes all the way out to the star. Uh, we'll talk about ways to set that goal for students. We want to set a, an ambitious goal for students. And then you can clearly see the persistence that the teacher had in implementing interventions to try to uh, see if we can get the students progress monitoring data up to that goal. So in the first intervention right here, we can see that uh, there were individual data points. There's sort of some highs and lows. Uh, you can see that clearly in this data. So we want something that will kind of balance out or stabilize that data. Uh, so we implement or uh, uh, put into this data trend lines that actually sort of capture the essence of how of what this data in this particular intervention is showing us. So the trend of the data in this intervention one is actually not uh, on track to meet goal. And so we can see here when we look at this trend line right here, we can see that at this point the student is not on track to meet goal line. So the teacher makes a second, makes an instructional change and actually implements a second intervention and you can see that in intervention two. Uh, and how was the student doing in intervention two? Well, you can see, unfortunately, in this case, as, as you might have just uh, suggested, that in intervention two, yet again, the student's trend line is not on track to meet goal line. So we can see here, here's that trend of data. It's trending down away from where we want to go for the goal line. In intervention three, uh, once again, data is stronger this time. The student is growing, but trend, once again, still not on track to meet goal. And finally, in intervention four, uh, we all want to know what that is, right? So look at this nice, lovely trend going up here. A uh, trend actually is on track, uh, is surpassing the goal in this case, uh, a great ending to all of that persistence. So this just gives you an example of what that DBI process looks like sort of um, uh, as a teacher would implement it. We're gonna go back and talk through all of these different components so that you can have nice graph data, uh, you can set a goal for students, and so that uh, you'll be able to monitor your students' performance and progress uh, and see how they're doing with a particular intervention. We know that evidence-based interventions work for a lot of students, but not every evidence-based intervention works for all students. And the students we're talking about that we implement DBI with, they all have really unique and individualized needs. So we need a unique and individualized program. And, and, and that's really what DBI brings to the table. So we're going to talk a little bit next about a model or framework of DBI uh, that we're going to be using as sort of our overarching model uh, for, this, for this module on progress monitoring. Uh, this uh, framework of DBI is from the National Center on Intensive Intervention, and you can see uh, the different components of this module. Uh, over here we've got uh, first uh, Tier 2 validated intervention program. We're hoping that prior to starting the DBI process that intervention and instruction has been put into place, that we've collected some data to determine whether that's working for students. And that data we're collecting is actually progress monitoring data. 
we look at that ongoing progress monitoring data and we determine, one, if the student is responsive to that instruction or not responsive. If the student is responsive, we continue that cycle of current instruction. If the student is non-responsive, then we want to move to our next steps, diagnostic, collecting some diagnostic information, and then adapting that intervention. If you remember on that last side, slide where we just looked at the graph data, there were some intervention changes that the teacher implemented. That's that intervention adaptation. It's really important to continue that cycle of progress monitoring and that determination of responsive or non-responsive to intervention to continue to determine and make good decisions about what's working or what's not working for a particular student. Uh, as we move through and talk through some of these steps, we're gonna talk more about present level of performance and setting goals. We're gonna talk about uh, implementing that high quality instruction with fidelity. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about collecting progress monitoring data and using decision rules to, to make um, good decisions about whether we should continue the current instruction or intervention or whether we need to make a change. So now let's look at a case study of what DBI might look like in action. We're gonna look at the case of Zane. So Zane is a third grade student. Uh, Zane is in special education and receives uh, services as a child that's identified with a learning disability. He gets that 25 minutes of small group instruction three times a week. So some of Zane's strengths, he's motivated to read. He especially likes reading about animals. He likes to choose books from the library about animals. He's receptive to corrective feedback. So when the teacher provides specific corrective feedback, he seems to benefit from that and actually um, takes those changes and makes, uh, takes those suggestions and makes changes to his, to, his, to his reading. And he's made a lot of progress in decoding from word lists in particular. Uh, on the other hand, some of his weaknesses are in the areas of fluency. Uh, he frequently guesses at words. So, um, if, and especially if the text is not in his interest area, uh, we continue to see more errors. And he has consistent difficulties with more difficult words that have affixes, including multisyllabic words. So sort of a, a, a mixed um, bag of strengths and weaknesses, uh, but Zane's teacher is interested in what she can do to, to help him. So now that Zane's teacher, Ms. Smith, has some ideas about some of Zane's strengths and weaknesses, she knows a little bit about his reading interests. Uh, typically when he selects those books about animals, they're about at the second grade level. Um, he particularly seems to like books about dinosaurs. So she knows a little bit more about his reading interests, his reading level, but she needs to dig a little deeper and find out more about what skills to target. Uh, she knows she wants to continue some of those basic foundational skills like phonics instruction, phonemic awareness. Uh, she also would like to start moving him towards practice with passage reading and fluency, especially because he's in third grade now. She really wants to increase his ability to, to do more uh, longer reading, to increase his stamina for reading, and so she wants to incorporate some partner reading, some repeated reading. Um, she continues to dig into these diagnostics to determine where to start next with students. She's not quite sure where to start uh, with her phonics instruction, and she's not uh, exactly sure what his independent instructional reading levels are. She knows he's about second grade, but she wants to find out more, and so she actually uses the core phonics survey uh, CORE is a Center on Reading Excellence. It's a published uh, phonics survey. And this indicates that Zane has mastered uh, CVC and CVCE words, but he's still not mastered many consonant or vowel blends. And again, it shows he's struggling with those affixes and multisyllabic words. She knew a little bit about this before. 
So she uses this information to carefully sequence the order in which she'll teach letter sounds. Uh, she also, it, it helps her to determine what letter sounds he's already mastered so that she doesn't need to work on those again. So this di diagnostic information really helps Ms. Smith uh, sort of hone in or target those skills that she'll work on next with Zane. So she starts out by giving Zane uh, a third grade oral reading uh, fluency measure. Um, she gave a third grade measure to, to Zane and he read about 45 words correctly in a minute, uh, but he only read his accuracy was only about 75%. And so she knew that she probably needed to back up to a second grade level. She wanted him to be a little more accurate. We're shooting for about 90% accuracy. And so uh, he was at 75% accuracy on a third grade measure. So she backed up to those second grade level measures. Uh, when she started with the second grade level measures, uh, he got uh, on three uh, measures that were given right in a row to collect baseline data. His scores were 50, 56, and 52. And we take the median or the middle score when those scores are aligned from lowest to highest to determine our starting point for, for baseline. So in this case, uh, this time when he read these measure, uh, when he read uh, the second grade level measures, his accuracy was now in the 90% range. Uh, when he did his first measure that where he scored 50, his accuracy was 91%. So we know we're now in the range of where he can read accurately. Uh, his median score then, that 52, is the starting point then for how we'll set up his graph. We call that sometimes his baseline or his present level of performance, but it's 52 words correct per minute, and that's gonna be our starting point, and that's at a second grade level. So Ms. Smith now has a great way to start uh, setting up a graph for Zane. So the next step is to actually create a goal for Zane. And so she takes that 52 words uh, read correctly at 91% accuracy, and then she looks at the recommended benchmark goals for the measure she's using. In this case, Ms. Smith is using DIBBLES, uh, Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy Skills. <coughs> Excuse me, she's using the DIBBLES Oral Reading Fluency Measures. Uh, DIBBLES, uh, uh, are a good measure to use. There are lots of measures available. Uh, in a little while, I'll introduce you to a way uh, that you can go online and look at a nice tools chart to give you more information about the characteristics of different types of uh, measures, different types of commercially available measures. Uh, but here we're using Dibbles. It's a free measure, just as an example. And so she, uh, Ms. Smith, looks at the goals or benchmarks that are set uh, by Dibbles. They created this by collecting data from lots of students all over uh, the U.S. who are at that second grade level. And she determines that in the spring, the goal would be for students at the second grade level uh, to read 111 words correctly with 95% or better accuracy. So she determines that by May, Zane will read 111 words or more correctly across three consecutive weeks with 95% accuracy or better. He is starting at 52, but his long-term goal is 111. What does this look like in graph format? Well, we can see his goal here. It's represented you know, out in May, as she said below, uh, as, she, as we said before. Here's his goal, and then she's going to start collecting some ongoing progress monitoring data for Zane. Ideally, she's collecting some data on a weekly basis, and you, so you can see that data represented here. She's collecting that data, and then she's looking at how the data compares to the goal line that was set for, for Zane. In this case, the yellow line that you see, this line right here, we're comparing that to the goal line. So right here, that's the trend of the data for Zane so far. 
And we can compare that to the goal to make decisions about how he's progressing in the current instruction that she's providing. In the first uh, example, as we looked before just now at uh, Zane's initial data, you could see that the trend line was actually below the goal line. And so Ms. Smith uh, decided to, he's, he's making progress, but he's not increasing at the rate that we would hope. And so um, she actually uh, decides to remove some of the word attack and word list reading practice and make a change and add more sentence and passage level reading practice. Again, she's trying to pick evidence-based interventions, but she's putting, making changes uh, in, in Zane's instruction and intervention, and then continuing to progress monitor to see if that works. Uh, she draws this red line that you see right here to indicate a change in intervention and then she continues to collect that weekly data. So as she con continues to collect weekly data for this new intervention, uh, how are things going for Zane, would you say? So if you said that he's not on track based on trend compared to goal, if he's not on track, then you would be right. Unfortunately, this new intervention is still not helping him to get on track to meet his goal line. So after uh, eight data points, uh, she considers that she needs to probably make another change. So now we see um, that Zane is making progress. Uh, he is on track to meet his goal. Um, Ms. Smith has uh, implemented a change that incorporates some reading at the passage level. Uh, she is providing immediate corrective feedback to him. And then she's continuing to do some decoding and phonemic awareness instruction. Uh, but you can see his data in the blue is indicating that now his trend of data is on track to meet his goal line. So right here we can see that different than the past trend lines we saw, that now his trend line is indicating that he's actually going to surpass, here was his goal line, that he's actually going to surpass his goal line. And that's the kind of trend we wanna see. We want that closer to that goal line, uh, either matched with it or surpassing the goal line to indicate that the intervention uh, is having a positive effect on student progress. So Ms. Smith feels good about what she's done with Zane She's actually dug in and she's identified diagnostically some of the areas that he might have difficulty with. And then she's tried to really target her instruction to those diagnostics. So now you're going to uh, do a little activity where you process what we've talked about so far in DBI. Um, there's a brief on the DBI website. You can see the link up here. This is also in your readings folder, uh, but I want you to look at that. Um, you might either do this individually or um, you might work with a partner to do this. Uh, and after you read that brief, I want you to write a brief response to each of these questions. One, what barriers do you see in relation to teachers implementing the assessment components of DBI? Two, what specifically do you feel you need to know more about to implement the assessment components? And what do you hope to learn in this module? So we've learned a little bit so far, uh, but what, what more, uh, what are the next things that you need to learn? So uh, take a moment now, uh, read this uh, brief and then either uh, work in partners to answer these questions or you can answer the questions individually and then sort of share out uh, in small groups or as an entire class.